Why is it when students get to learn biology efficiently it's always because of you three? Hi, say hi. Hi, I'm Mariam. Okay, so the first part is about absorption, or to be more specific, is the adaptation of ileum and villus in the absorption of digested food. Okay, so simple molecules produced from the digested food are absorbed in the ileum of the small intestine. The ileum is already adapted to the absorption of digested food. Why? Because well, its internal layer is folded and covered by tiny projections called villi. The villi has a few characteristics which allows it to adapt to the absorption of nutrients. Sad characteristics would be of the following, starting with the network of blood capillaries which helps to transport digestive products to the whole body. Can't forget lacteal that carries droplets of fatty acids and glycerol. Next, the surface layer of the villus, which is also known as the epithelial layer, that is only one cell thick, and hence accelerating the level of nutrient absorption. The last adaptation is the presence of gobbled cells, which secrete mucus that function as a aid in digestion. Okay, so end of story on the villus, we are moving on to microvillus. So, um, microvillus is located on the surface of the villus epithelium. The microvillus can adapt to the absorption of digested food due to the large surface area that it provides, which increases the rate of nutrient absorption. Do you ever wonder how does our body absorb drugs such as medicine that we consume when we are sick? Well, let's see how it actually works. Absorption is transfer of drug from cell of administration to the bloodstream. The rate and extent of absorption depends on three factors which is environment where drug is absorbed, chemical characteristic of the drug and route of administration. Absorption will affect bioavailability which means how quickly and how much of drug could reach its target site. Maximum absorption occurs through intravenous routes such as injections. There are four ways drugs can be migrated from the GI tract which are The first one is passive diffusion aka the most common mechanism in absorption of drug. In this process, drug moves from high concentration area to lower concentration area and it do not involve a carrier. Second one is facilitated diffusion. In facilitated diffusion, other agents enter the cell and facilitate the passive of large molecules. These carrier proteins undergo conformational and allow drug movement. The third one is active transport. In active transport, drug moves from low concentration area to higher concentration area. This process is an energy dependent process and the energy is derived from ATP. The last process is endocytosis and exocytosis. These processes are used to transport drugs of large size across cell membrane. Endocytosis refers to engulfment of drug while exocytosis is the reverse. Next, we will learn about five factors that influence absorption. The first one is effect of pH of the drug that we consume. The second one is blood flow to absorption site which is the small intestine. The third one is total surface area available for absorption. The fourth one is contact time at absorption surface. And the last one is aspiration of P-glycoprotein. Before we go further into assimilation, let's recall what we have learned in Form 3. Assimilation is the movement of digested food molecules into the cells of the body where they are used. Now, we look at the role of circulatory system in the assimilation process. In the assimilation process that occurs in the cell, nutrients that have been digested are used to form complex compounds or structures of components in the cell. 
So the human circulatory system, which consists of blood circulatory system and the lymphatic system, helps to transport nutrients to the cell to be assimilated. Now we look at the process that happen in the blood capillary and also lactal after the absorption of food in the small intestine. In the blood capillary, the blood capillaries will combine to form hepatic portal vein. This hepatic portal vein will transport blood which consists of sugar that is glucose and amino acid to the liver. Whereas lactals that transport droplets of lipid will form a bigger vessel that is part of the lymphatic system. So this lymphatic vessel will enter the thoracic duct that later flow into the subclavian vein. Subclavian vein is a part of circulatory system. So at the end, the lymphatic system will merge into the blood circulatory system. What is actually the functions of liver in the assimilation process? Well, there is three main functions of liver in the assimilation. The first one is metabolism of digested food. As we all know, glucose is used for cellular respiration while amino acids are used for synthesizing plasma proteins and enzymes. Through the deamination process, excess amino acids are turned into urea to be excreted through the urine. The second one is detoxification. Liver cells expel toxic substances from the blood such as drugs, alcohol and other foreign substances. Those toxic substances are expelled through the urine. And the last one is storage of nutrients. Excess glucose is converted to glycogen to be stored. And liver also become a place to store vitamins and mineral salts. Now we are going to see the assimilation process that occurs in the liver. The first one we are going to look into amino acids. Amino acids are used to synthesize plasma, protein and enzyme. Excess of amino acids cannot be stored in the body, hence the excess of amino acids are broken down through the process of deamination. So through the process of deamination, the excess of amino acids will form, form into urea, urea which which later being expelled through the urine and when the glucose supply is insufficient, the liver is able to convert amino acid into glucose. Okay, next the assimilation. Um, the assimilation of glucose in the liver. So glucose is used for cellular respiration as, as we know the function of glucose is to generate energy. Okay, and if the glucose is excess, the excess of the glucose is converted to glycogen and this glycogen will be stored in the liver. But then the, glu the glucose level in the blood decreases or going low. The glycogen is converted back to glucose because our body needs energy through the cellular respiration. However, if the glycogen supply reaches the maximum level, then the excess of glucose is converted to fats. Now we we look at the assimilation process in the cells. Uh, for amino acids, uh, Amino acids are used to synthesize the new uh, protoplasm in the cells and amino acids are used in repairing the damaged tissue. It's also uh, used to synthesize hormones and enzymes. Uh, next, in the glucose. Uh, glucose is oxidized through cellular respiration to release energy, water and carbon dioxide. Uh, excess glucose is kept in the glycogen in the muscle. Energy is used for the process such as protein synthesis. This energy comes from the cellular respiration which the substrate needed is glucose and the next one is assimilation of lipids assimilation of lipids such as the phospholipid and cholesterol uh, are actually primary components that build up at the plasma membrane fat is also oxidized to release energy when there is insufficient glucose excess fats are kept in the adipose tissue that we can find underneath the skin that's all from us thank you